Welcome to CISO Interviews, where Affinia hosts cybersecurity executives sharing career advice, actionable insights, and tips so that you can enhance your career and succeed as well. Christopher, thank you so much for joining us today. As we begin, can you say a few words about your current role and what you've been up to? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. Thank you, Misha. Uh, I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at Clover Health. And so I've been there about five years now. And Clover Health is in the Medicare insurance space. We also have uh, software offerings. So we develop AI ML based programs that help providers have better Medicare outcomes uh, mm -hmm. for their patients. Awesome. Five years. That's, uh, I think it's a world record. I think most of the CISO <laughs> that I see these days, it's uh, 18 months, 12 months. So what's, uh, what's your secret? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. And especially at Clover, you know, it started as a small startup, uh, brought them through a SPAC into public. And so a company like that always has a lot of turnover. Um, I think what I've done is created a risk-based approach and just really kept in mind the whole time, this is a business that is out to help customers and to, you know, get Medicare plans and the people of those who need it most. And so with that, when you balance that risk and reward and you keep in line with the strategy the business is, uh, it's really hard for anything to go wrong. I see. I see. No, but it's, it's very impressive. And also, especially given that healthcare in general is a heavily regulated space, I would imagine uh, you're dealing with personal identifiable information, whether in uh, on, on the client side, on the uh, patient side. So it's it's certainly very very impressive and very commendable and congrats. But um, switching gears, like how did you get into cybersecurity? I've noticed um, uh, Microsoft, Nokia. You've uh, you have some uh, some notches in your belt. Uh, what was the first uh, first step in this direction? This episode is brought to you by Athenia, a community where two thousand CISOs and other senior executives network, learn, and succeed together. To apply for your complimentary membership, please visit www.afinia.com or click the link in the show notes. Now, back to the show. Yeah, you know, I have an interesting career path. Uh, in my former life, I was a pilot. Uh, mm -hmm. and I was in the aviation and airline industry and that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, you know, I was changing gears. Things were happening in the economy. Um, I had always had an interest in security. And when I was younger, I was the kid who was, you know, building my own computer, tearing apart my shortwave radio, whatever it may be to see how it works. Uh, and so I had a lot of that homegrown experience. And, you know, back then there weren't any real university courses. It was a very new field, you know? Uh, and I was interviewing at Nokia and uh, I happened to really impress them with a mix of business and information security skill sets. And it turned out that that's exactly what they're looking for. And it helped me grow my career. And then I went up through the ranks at Nokia. And interestingly enough, they were such a big company that they had aspects of healthcare because they were collecting some health data, uh, you know, telecom, business, you name it. I got into mergers and acquisitions there. So I helped bring in this merger and acquisitions piece, the security component of that. And then what that can do to really change the price of buying a company, those kind of things. So it was a lot of fun and really interesting. And then obviously from Nokia, Microsoft acquired Nokia, they acquired me. And so I ran down that path for a while and I got into a lot of interesting, interesting things like the HoloLens project and uh, lots of fun stuff there. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to change. I wanted something different. I wanted different challenges. And uh, for a short stint, I was at T-Mobile and I worked there doing their vulnerability management program. So pen test, that kind of thing, leading that team. Uh, and then from there, I went on to Eagleview, which was a smaller startupish company, uh, does GIS imaging. And so basically works with insurance. And so you can see that insurance piece with some previous healthcare stuff led into this healthcare mm -hmm. space. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I think it's very unique uh experience uh it's interesting we, we talked to a lot of people and, and it seems like there is no kind of one true path into cybersecurity but i don't think many pilots are now uh senior cybersecurity <laughs> executives so it's, it's it's certainly but also but also kind of within this haven't had experience of large organizations like nokia like microsoft and also uh more uh, kind of mid-sized uh, enterprise organizations uh, in, the, in the same vein. I think that gives you a very unique perspective and very unique vantage point 
you've you've seen it all. Uh, so from that standpoint, what's your advice for some someone who's maybe maybe a little bit more junior in their career, maybe they're looking to transition mid-career from technology to cyber, or maybe even more upstream of that, someone who's uh, still uh, in college is trying to figure out what to do with their life. What what are two or three things you think they should focus on to set them up for success? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and the environment's changed so much, like you said. And I think right now, there's this strange transition around the CISO role. It's becoming more prominent. You're seeing executive orders coming through, uh, the recent SEC ruling where, you know, on the on the docket was having security experience on the board. So you really want to understand, and I kind of touched on this before, that business and security have to go hand in hand. It's not a one or a zero. Uh, you're not here to lock down this company. You're here to balance the risk and reward, and you need to understand what those business risks are so you can make intelligent business decisions from a security perspective and convey those. So really anyone coming up, take some business courses. Uh, you know, it's not just all tech. There's the, especially in my industry, heavily regulated. So I deal on a daily basis with legal, you know, the compliance teams, there's all the, the privacy, there's all these different things going on. So you really have to have a lot of hats on when you're security. And if you don't have a good holistic understanding of business in general, you're going to have a hard time. Interesting. Interesting. It's actually, it's kind of resonates with what I'm hearing because uh, back in the day, uh, the the running joke was uh, cybersecurity is the department of no. That's that's when the new initiatives go to die because when business brings you some project, like, well, we can do this because it will expose us to something. So, and I think that to your point, that's changing. So cybersecurity leaders see themselves as being part of the business, not not kind of a layer on top uh, and they think of themselves as enablers. Yes, yes, we can, but in a secure way so that they, they bring the cybersecurity perspective in a business conversation rather than being uh, kind of providing a no right off the bat and just because uh, it, it's uh, change transformation is kind of the nature of things with the way things are going with technology and, and I know I can bring geopolitics into this, but it's just, it's not an option anymore. And it's, to your point, it's important for someone to have this perspective and, and have this mindset early on to set them up for success and really kind of go from zero to one and one to 10 and go to the C-level uh, C level position. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, and it's, it's interesting when I talk with my team, once a week, we have a quick meeting, catch up. And I say the same thing, everything, every time we start, I say the same thing. And this is this is a tip to all CISOs out there, right? Um, we aren't the department of no. We, we don't say no, we say, how can we, right? And that's the trick. Because if you're seen as the department of no, no other C-suite person is going to take you seriously, right? It's always problem solution. So mm -hmm. how can we do it? And if the CISO knows that, that's great. But does your team know that? Are they interacting with the other business teams knowing that? So, But I think it's also kind of it's um, um, cybersecurity executives, it feels like they're taking, whether they want it or not, they're take, taking the role of an educator of sorts. And it partially comes from the fact that now you mentioned the CC with the uh, a requirement to have someone on the board, the cybersecurity perspective, I think. And I mean, people read newspapers, it's in the in the headlines, this bridge, that bridge, ransomware, uh, the payouts, it's just, and the the threats are getting formidable. They're not teenagers in hoodies in mom's <laughs> basement anymore. These are well-resourced enterprise scale organizations with, with uh, uh, vacation policies and pension plans that that we're we're up against so uh the nature of threats has changed so uh, with this in mind it's it's certainly helpful that people across the organization you, you mentioned you mentioned legal procurement third party exposure uh c level uh, ceos coos the board it, it feels it's more in the air so people understand that the only way to do business is to to do it securely because in the end of the day you get like trust in the end of the day with your consumers, with your constituencies. It's like something takes decades to build and it goes away in a second if something goes sideways. So it's it's certainly helpful that it, it feels the world is moving towards cybersecurity be, being more prevalent just by the virtue of the fact that technology is playing such a big role in our lives and we're much more dependent on it and therefore exposed to risks that come, come with it. So it's 
it's exciting and challenging and uh but also looks like people people get more what cybersecurity executives do and it, it makes it a little bit a little bit helpful at least they understand that they cannot just run on their own without any any guardrails yeah you know an acronym i usually use when i'm talking to the board is most of the company is the race car and security are the brakes and that may be a bad thing to some people, but you can't get around those tight corners without slowing down for a second to get going. Ah, right? it's very, very good, Christopher. This will go as a quote in the quote card on LinkedIn. I, I promise. This is this is really good. This is really good. I love it. Thank um, you. Uh, from what do you see now? It's it's such a fast changing environment with technology. What are some of the more top of mind threats? that CISOs are thinking about or concerned about or anxious about? Yeah, you know, I'm gonna, I think probably everyone's heard this a hundred times, but you know, with the rise of AI, that's obviously a big change. And if you haven't got your head wrapped around what that means, you don't have a policy and a standard set up for your company, um, you're running a little behind schedule, right? You've really got to get that ingrained in your business. Windows 11 came out, Copilot's installed, it's there, they're already using it, right? So what have you done to do that? Um, and I think it's not a big a mountain as everyone thinks, as long as you take it in bite-sized pieces, it's very manageable. It's nothing too different from what we have seen, you know, when, oh, SaaS application, it's this big, crazy thing. It's just another thing. And that's the life of a CISO, right? There's always a new thing coming around the corner. Um, and it's all risk-based. Again, you have to weigh the risks and the rewards what is the threshold that's okay with the company? If you talk to the CFO, if you had those conversations to make sure that everyone understands the risk threshold, the risk appetite, and the company's moving along those lines and you're working with the strategy of the business. Interesting. Interesting. And kind of to double click on that, like, there are different kind of threads in it. So, and do you see it more around protecting sensitive information from being used for training models? and potentially being accessed by third parties? Or is it more along the lines of the data lakes getting poisoned, the ones that are used for LLM training? Or um, uh, obviously kind of AI tools used by attackers. I, I for On a personal perspective, I see uh, phishing emails. They, I think they cleaned up the grammar a little bit and it's not... Yep. Dear sir or madam, <laughs> um, <laughs> not, not anymore. So I think they uh, obviously clearly using uh, uh, some of the, and it, it's probably just the tip of the iceberg now. It, it's probably going to go uh, evolve over time in terms of sophistication and just playing on um, human psychology. But so kind of those kind of three different rabbit holes, uh, which one is you think is more important from hey, the- I'm going to have to say they're all important because- you know, with the poisoning, you've got potential sabotage, you have insider threat to schedule employees, you've got competitors, you name it, right? The whole thing about the phishing and using deep fakes. Uh, there was one recently, I believe, where someone used a video in deep fake and got someone to transfer a whole bunch of money. Uh, we're seeing those kind of things come in through phishing, smishing, you name it. So they're all equally important. And I think they have to be tackled strategically. And you have to look, what does this mean? And again, this is a very old kind of way of thinking, but it still stands true. That security awareness piece, that people are the front line, people are the firewall, that holds true. And with AI as well, right? If someone's saying, hey, transfer me money for a gift card, then I'm the CEO, don't fall for the common tactics. AI still uses social engineering. They're still using that sense of pressure and that uh, urgency to get people to do things. So be aware uh, and create a holistic strategy around all those things, obviously, including security awareness. Interesting. Interesting. I, I One of the takes that I, that I we hear sometimes um, where people, I mean, you can invest in the best systems, but often humans to the uh, social engineering you, you mentioned, often humans are still are the weakest link. Uh, and the the quip that people bring up usually it's uh, you, you you can't upgrade your systems you can't patch your systems but you can't patch a user and it's it, I don't I don't necessarily agree with this I think um, a lot to be said about kind of training but how do you think about this technology yeah. versus humans because it's it's kind of it's you have systems and you have people right so uh, what are some of the your thoughts on how to best approach this uh, so that we don't we don't invest everything in building this 
wall around the castle and then leave the door somewhere it's completely unattended. Absolutely. And, you know, I think training is a piece of it and everyone focuses on that heavily. I do believe it is. But honestly, it's the security team's job to change the culture of the company, the thinking. Right. Um, and I, I'm proud to say that we've done that where I am today. We have a lot of people who immediately start thinking of things security first. Right. So starting a project, starting a thing, got an email, whatever it is. They're not just thinking of some training they took where, you know, they clicked a box or watched a video. It's really that business integration and having people from security integrated with the business, even if they're just listening in on that meeting, because they're going to provide tips and that changes the culture of people. And when that culture is changed, they start thinking like a security person, not at the same level, but once you have that baseline, um, you are going a long way to reduce a lot of risk and a lot of threat that's come through. Interesting. So it's almost like the entire organization is part of your cybersecurity team in a way, right? Has to be. Has to be. And they have to be thinking that way to a certain extent, because um, right now, the way we do it, when we're in a call, we're saying, hey, what about this? What about that? Oh, I didn't think of that. But then over time, they think of that, even if you're not in the meeting. And they'll come to you proactively and say, I've learned a bit. I know how to do this now. You know what I mean? And they're proud to do it. Uh, just like when I sit in a marketing meeting, sure, I learn a little bit more about marketing. And I use that in the security thing. How's my branding? To, well, to your point, it's you have to wear a business hat. You can't just be a tech guy who who, who marketing kind of is like, hey, we launched the product, a product last Friday. Do you? Sprinkle some cybersecurity pixie dust and make it make it make it okay because it's already launched. Or like, hey, we're already uh, approved this vendor. It's already in the system. The first payment going out on Monday. Do do your due diligence to make sure that their systems are okay. They have full access to our environment to to production site. Yeah, you know, I know I'm a man of a lot of sayings, but anyone who does that is building a house and calling the electrician after the walls are in and is all done. That's a big job to put the wires in after. <laughs> well, it's kind of like, it's interesting. Like someone created this analogy with, uh, with technology is like, it's like pouring concrete, right? So when it's not poured, everything is flexible and everything can be adjusted to your specifications and moved around once you pour and it, it's taken hold. It's a lot more difficult and expensive to, to move things. So it's uh I, I love it. I'm going to borrow that from my repertoire. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll borrow your brakes and the race car. I think it's it's really good. So we'll, it's, it's a good trade. Um, well, again, if we look at, we kind of discussed the now, but uh, what are some of the trends you're seeing? Uh, maybe it's technology related. Maybe it's, again, geopolitics uh, or kind of just the societal changes six months from now, 12 months from now. What are some of the trends that you think will play out that maybe some people are not paying attention to. Maybe they're already kind of emerging, uh, but what will be top of mind for cybersecurity executives in, in about one year's time? Yeah, in about one year's time. So I think you're going to start seeing a lot more regulatory activity, not just in the U.S., but globally. Um, and I think today there was an announcement that the government is going to be putting on some restrictions around how much data can be sent to certain countries, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're starting to run into the realm of privacy and security. So regulatory is going to really start picking up. You're going to see the board start asking for a lot more information. And it kind of jumps back to that whole culture piece. If you haven't worked on your program to shift the culture and you aren't embedded with the business units, it's a bigger lift, right? It's a heavier lift to get there. So I think that's one of the, the main things you're going to see. The other thing I think you're going to start seeing is the muddy water between the CIO and the CISO, right? Because yes, there's a lot of companies now that are, you know, they'll handle all your laptop and, and you know, peripheral needs, that kind of thing. That's not really it. And I think the CIO role is, is you know, really shifting towards an infrastructure and other things. There's a lot of other things happening there mm -hmm. because the CISO has purview into IT stuff and IT into CIS, into security stuff. So you're starting to see this sort of rebalancing of who does what and what goes where. Always a good idea to have a racy, that kind of thing, right? Uh, I'm not saying that the CIO is going away. I say I think that the role is changing just as the role of the CISO has changed. Because with things moving to the cloud, you're starting to notice that engineering teams are taking over those roles. But then you get this conflict around one of the basic NIST, uh, CSF categories, inventory of assets. Well, if IT is not doing it and engineering is doing it, 
who's doing it. And we have these, you know, shadow IT starts popping up everywhere, which obviously is a security concern. So I think you're going to start seeing some of those, you know, frictions happening and that change happening where everyone sorts out what they're doing and the dust kind of settles. I think also you're going to see that the C-suite and the boards are going to start demanding to know more. They want this information, but they want it in a way where it's gone through that litmus test, right? It's gone through the proper phases. I see a lot of security people who send information up and it's just a problem. Where's the problem solution, right? What's happening? So what I do is I built a risk management program. I created a, a, a risk framework around Carver, which is an old uh, military acronym of the bombers used to use to drop bombs on certain locations. And they'd say, okay, C is criticality, right? A, accessibility. How can they get in there? I've modified that to a certain extent for security. And so what I do is we get this risk score, we find out what it is, and then we go to these business units, be it SRE, IT, engineering, marketing, whoever. And we say, here's the risk. Here's what we need done. And you know, here's a timely manner based on the company's threat risk threshold. And so Oftentimes, security people, that's where the ball drops, right? We don't get that happening. and We don't get that escalation up to the top. How do we do it effectively? Well, we have a risk response form. And so the person does the traditional accept, remediate, whatever, and they put when and what time. So what's your strategy to get this resolved and how long will it take? And then security looks at that. We can escalate that up to their leadership, up to the board, whatever. But there's this formal process that says this is how this works. And many people would say, well, then IT or SE is going to be upset with you. No, they're our business partner. Maybe they can't do it because they don't have enough resources. And so then it gets up to the leadership level above, you know, maybe the CIO has been asking for these kind of things for a while. But this just gives fuel to the fire that, hey, there are federal requirements, there's security requirements, there's regulatory, you know, NIST, HIPAA, whatever. We've got all these things. Now you're helping these people with fuel in the fire to get more resources or to reprioritize certain things. It's not always about money. So I think that is one of those things that is going to be a big shift in the future. You're going to see this, this uh, desire for the board and the C-suite to have information and understand it. And something like that helps you solve it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. It makes a lot of sense because it's instead of just say, hey, you have this problem over there. What are you going to do about it? It's like, hey, there's this problem over there. How can we work together on developing a range of action plans and hopefully agreeing to one that's optimal? Number one, so it beca well, one becomes actionable and the other, the department in, in question becomes involved in the outcome and involved in the process of formulating uh, and signing off on, on the action plan. And everything is apples to apples so that the sea level at the board level, they can see the range of issues and say, well, this looks like a dumpster fire uh, and it's an easy fix. This looks like can be punted to next quarter. So they have an apples to apples comparison so they can prioritize and say, well, this is now, this is tomorrow, this is three weeks from now. And I, and I would say, I wonder how many C CISOs out there feel this pressure of, well, I get a lot of pressure from the C-suite that says, how come I wasn't aware? How come I didn't know of these things while still trying to maintain relationships with engineering and others, right? So a plan like this solves that. It's transparency. It allows everyone to know really security is advising, right? We're notifying you of this risk. We're advising you. Of, we're giving you our security perspective of what could be done to fix this. But we understand just because we want it fixed and it should be fixed right away. Can the business do it right away? Do we have the money? Do we have the time, right? Is it the priority? But now there's transparency. Transparency. Everyone knows exactly what the risk is. And then business leaders combined can make the right decisions to keep the business ahead of others. I think it's such a good framework because to your point, one, it's just everyone is a business partner. So every department is a business partner of the other department and all are aligned against one objective of, of the business, number one. And number two, no one, no one can deny, there's no deniability like, oh, I didn't know it was happening. Like it's transparent. You made a call to prioritize or deprioritize and this is the outcome. So and many CISOs become the scapegoat and you, I've seen it a few times and I see where there's someone on the other side in the C-suite or somewhere someone says, I didn't know, I wasn't informed. This is a formal documented auditable process that says everyone was informed, right? 
Uh, not all risks are known, but when they are known, they're put into this process and everyone's aware. And it's not a bad business decision to take on risk. That's normal process, right? That's been happening long before uh, cybersecurity existed. Certainly. Well, business is risk, right? It's it's ta it's taking a risk and uh, help and kind of taking steps for a positive outcome, for sure. Well, Christopher, this, this was amazing. Uh, and by the way, uh, I don't know if this framework that you mentioned, the Carver, if it's proprietary or if we can share maybe a one pager with the Finia community. But if you're open to this, I think a lot of our members will find value. Uh, so again, maybe we can have a sidebar conversation about that. But as we wrap up, um, well, first, thank you. Thank you so much for taking time for this. This was so much fun. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, you know, I'm on LinkedIn, so feel free to find me there. I love chatting with other security minded people and coming up with solutions. Technically, people have always told me I have sort of disruptive, unorthodox ideas, and sometimes that really helps. So looking forward to chatting. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much. This was awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. If you like this episode, please subscribe to this channel and visit afenia.com for more information about your complimentary membership or click the link in the show notes.